Today on The Hookup, we're gonna take a beginner's look at my favorite program for home automation, Node-RED. I'm gonna show you how to use it in conjunction with Home Assistant to transform your connected home into a smart home. So did I throw anybody off by saying that Node-RED and not Home Assistant is my favorite program for home automation? Well, let's start out with the most common question that I get about Node-RED. And that's, if I'm already running Home Assistant, why do I need Node-RED? And conversely, if I already have Node-RED, why do I need Home Assistant? Well, on the surface, it might look like Node-RED and Home Assistant do the same things. But dig deeper and you'll find that they excel in very different areas. Home Assistant is irreplaceable for bringing all of your different devices under one unified platform and keeping track of the state of each of those devices. Home Assistant's automation and scripting user interfaces have come a long way in the last year, but I still find Node-RED significantly more powerful and user-friendly due to its visual user interface and excellent real-time output options. And setting up Node-RED in your Home Assistant installation only takes a few minutes, so why not? Thank you to Govi for sponsoring this video. Their latest product, the Immersion LED Strip, combines a 1080p camera mounted above or below your TV with their Color Sense controller to extend your TV's colors onto the surrounding wall. The Govi Immersion LEDs are specifically designed for TVs between 55 and 65 inches and come pre-soldered with flexible corner sections so installing them is a breeze and you won't need to do any cutting or bending of your LEDs. Because the system uses a camera instead of an HDMI connection, you can use it with any TV input, including your TV's built-in smart apps. The immersion package is compatible with Google Home and Amazon Echo devices, and also includes music reactivity and dynamic lighting modes. Check out Govi's immersion LEDs using the link in the description. For the purposes of this video, I'll be using a fresh installation of Home Assistant running on the new Home Assistant Blue hardware, but the process would be exactly the same if you're running a full Home Assistant install on a Raspberry Pi or a virtual machine. Assuming you've finished the initial onboarding process for Home Assistant, you're gonna click on the Supervisor button on the left side and then select the Add-on Store from the top bar. In the list of community add-ons, go down to Node-RED and hit Install. Next, head over to the Configuration tab and put in a credential secret like the documentation tells you to. Then, go back and start the add-on. You can always check the progress of an add-on's launch by looking at the Log tab. In my case, Node-RED failed to launch because I don't have SSL enabled on my fresh Home Assistant install, and I told Node-RED to use SSL in the configuration file. If you just installed Home Assistant, you probably don't have SSL either, so set those two parameters in the configuration to false, hit save, and then hit the start button one more time. This time everything loaded up properly and it was time to hop into the Node-RED web interface. Inside Node-RED, there are a few different important areas. On the left side are all the pre-installed node types. Each node is like a little skill that you give to Node-RED. And most of the must-have nodes are installed by default in the Home Assistant add-on package. But there are thousands more specialized nodes made by Node-RED contributors that you can install when and if you need them. The middle area in Node-RED is where you're gonna make all your automations. You can create as many tabs as you want using the bar at the top to organize your automations. Technically, each tab is called a flow, but I don't love that terminology, and I often mistakenly call each automation or sequence a flow. Before we go too much further, let me introduce you to the two most important node types, and we're gonna make our first sequence. If you're unfamiliar with Node-RED, you should really do this with me. On the left side, we're gonna find a node called Inject. You could browse through the node list like a maniac, or you can just use the search bar to filter results in real time. Pull that inject node into the main flow area. Inject is the second most important node for testing and learning in Node-RED. It gives you a small button that you can press to immediately trigger an input for your automations. If you double click on any node, it's gonna bring up the editable properties for that node. For inject, you can send a timestamp, which is selected by default, or you can choose between a bunch of other data types. We're gonna go with a string, which is the data type for a bunch of letters in a row, like a word or a sentence. Under message.payload, we're gonna type in the string, I did it, and under message.topic, we'll put in my first sequence. Hit the done button and then hit deploy, which is essentially the save button in Node-RED. Then click the little gray box on the side of the inject node. And just like that, nothing happens. If we wanna see the message we generate, we need to utilize the most important node, the debug node. In the left column, find the debug node and drag it into the main window. Then we're gonna connect the two nodes by dragging the inject's output, which is always on the right side of a node, to the debug's input, which is always on the left side. Hit deploy and then click your inject button. 
still seems like nothing. But if you open the debug window by clicking on the little bug icon in the right panel, you'll notice that it says, I did it, which it says is located in the message payload. And above that is the message topic, which has a value of my first sequence. As you get more advanced with Node Red, there's going to be a lot more message parts. So I always recommend changing your debug nodes to output the complete message object instead of just the message payload. So that way you can see everything. When viewing the complete message object, our debug window now contains an expandable entry that contains each message part, which in this case is the message ID, message payload, and message topic. In programming, we call this an object, and each object can have many associated properties, like topic or payload in this case. Just like my name is Rob, and Rob.eyes, Rob.hair, and Rob.shirt are all properties with values specific to me. But if you looked at someone else, like Dr. Z's, he's got Justin.eyes and Justin.shirt, which all have values that are specific to him. And he doesn't even have the Justin.hair property. Your objects can have as many properties as you want, and each will be passed through your entire sequence as it goes from the output of one node to the input of the next. The point of automation is to get your devices to behave in a specific way without you needing to explicitly tell them what to do. Some people take this to the extreme by having their lights and music turn on based on a specific person entering or exiting a room. But until my home can correctly identify my mood, my specific needs are just not that predictable. So instead, I use automation to make physical controls more intuitive. Let's look at my daughter's room. She's got RGBW LEDs under her bed, nano leaf tiles on the wall, an overhead fan light, and a standing lamp. One switch on the wall is physically wired to the standing lamp and the other is wired to the fan light. But that doesn't make much sense since these two lights should theoretically always get turned on together whenever you just want the room to be brighter. Similarly, the underbed lights and the nano leaf tiles seem like they should always be turned on together for mood lighting. But neither of them are connected to physical switches. So normally you'd need to use a voice command or a phone app to turn them on, which is not exactly convenient and definitely not intuitive. Behind these normal looking switches, I've installed Shelly Smart Relays, which when set to detach switch mode, enabled me to separately monitor the state of the physical switch while independently controlling the lights for each circuit using their internal relays. My end goal is to have the first switch control the fan light and the floor lamp together, and then the other switch control the nano leaf tiles and the underbed LEDs. And I want to do all this without messing with any wires in the wall. The first thing that I need to do is get all the devices into Home Assistant so they can talk to each other. The new Shelly integration might be the most painless way to add a device to Home Assistant that I've ever used. Unfortunately, I'm currently having some issues with it due to my own VLAN setup, causing it to revert to local pulling instead of local push. I'm in the process of figuring that out, but for this video, I'm going to set up my Shelly devices using MQTT, which requires editing the configuration file. The only additional thing that I'm going to do is add an MQTT binary sensor for each of the switches to monitor the actual switch position, which like I said is independent from the state of the relay when used in detached mode. Once you've added all your necessary devices, check the Home Assistant configuration and then go ahead and restart. Once Home Assistant comes back up, which is amazingly quick these days, you're going to do one more step before jumping into Node-RED, and that's restart the Node-RED add-on. If you skip this step, your new entities might not auto-populate into Node-RED, which is going to make your life a lot more difficult. Okay, let's get automating. Let's start out easy. We're just going to get the switches configured the way we want them. Pull out the Home Assistant state node and select the binary sensor output for your switch. In my case, I'm going to configure the first and the third switches in this panel. I happen to know that the two states that this node is going to output are going to be on or off. But remember, if you ever need to see what's coming out of a node, you can always just use a debug node, which will show you the exact output in the debug window. The next node we're going to use is called a switch node, which is like a fork in the road. We want one of the forks to correspond to the on payload, and the other one should be for off. If the message.payload is exactly on, it will travel out of the top output, and if it's exactly off, it will travel out of the bottom output. The switch node has a ton of different options for analyzing the properties of your message object, but in this one we're just going to leave it as equals equals, which means that the values are exactly equal. When the first switch turns on, it will generate an on payload which travels up through the switch node, and then we want it to turn on both the floor lamp and the ceiling light. To do this, we'll use a Home Assistant call services node. In this node, we'll set up the domain to switch and the service to turn on. Then, under Entity ID, you can just start typing the names of the Home Assistant entities that you want to turn on, and the field will auto-complete for you. 
If you want to turn on more than one entity, you can just separate it with a comma and then keep on typing. In my case, I want to specify the entity ID for the ceiling light and the floor lamp. When the switch turns off, it will generate an off payload, and that's going to travel down the bottom output of the switch node. Since I want to control the exact same entities, I can just copy and paste the call services node that I just set up. But instead of the turn on service, I'll change it to turn off. For the third switch, we can repeat the exact same process. But because the RGBW2 and the NanoLeaf are classified as lights in Home Assistant and not switches, we'll need to change the domain to light instead of switch. I'll enter the entity IDs for the NanoLeaf and the Shelly RGBW2, and I'll configure the turn on and turn off services accordingly. At this point, the automation is complete, and after hitting deploy, the lights should just work as expected. But we can do better, so let's kick it up a notch. The NanoLeaf comes with all kinds of effects, and the RGBW2 can of course be colors other than white. Again, normally to control these attributes, you'd use a voice command or a phone app, but there's definitely a better way. Usually, if you're going to put on colored lighting, you'll use it alone. But if you just want the room to be brighter, you'd want the lights to turn on as white. So to intuitively control these color devices, we need to check if the other lights in the room are on and then decide what we want to do based on that data. To check the specific state of a Home Assistant entity, you can use the current state node, which will output either on or off for a switch and a bunch more information for a light. In this case, we'll split our output one more time based on the current state information. Using a switch node after the current state node, we can add another fork to the road and send different turn on commands to the NanoLeaf and RGBW2. In addition to turning the light on and off, the call services node can also specify tons of other attributes under the data field. For the mood lighting, I had my daughter pick out the colors, effects, and brightness that she wanted using the Home Assistant app, and then I used the current state node to discover their exact values. In the debug window, you can click on the copy value button next to attributes to get all the current values in the correct JSON format. If the current state of the ceiling light is off, my daughter wants the NanoLeaf to turn on using the ocean effect at 192 brightness, and the bed LEDs to be set to teal at 204 brightness. However, if the room lights are already on, the NanoLeaf and underbed LEDs should turn on to warm white instead. To specify these additional attributes, you're going to want to use the data field and you're going to want to put them in JSON form. If you've copied the information from the debug window, you can just paste it in the data field and delete any unnecessary attributes, which will ensure that your data is given in the right format. After hitting deploy, there are no errors, so we should just be able to walk into the room and flip the first light switch to turn on the ceiling light and floor lamp together. Then, if we flip on the third switch, the NanoLeaf and the underbed LEDs come on as warm white, as expected. If I instead flip the third switch, then the NanoLeaf tiles and the underbed LEDs come on as the mood lighting that my daughter requested. If she ever wanted to have the colored lights on with the white lights, she can just flip the third switch and then the first switch. And then if she wanted to change the NanoLeaf and the bed lights to white, she'd just flip the third switch off and then on again. Perfect. This is just a small example of the automations that can be accomplished with Node Red, but really your imagination is the only limit. With the built in nodes, you've got things like HTTP, TCP, and MQTT based messages, tons of Home Assistant specific controls, and even the ability to send and receive messages via things like Twitter, Amazon Echo, and email. However, that only scratches the surface of the possible nodes, and community developed nodes can easily be added via the palette manager, allowing you more control over your devices and the ability to add almost any functionality that you can dream of. If this video left you wanting more, don't worry, I've got a second Node-RED video playing in the very near future. But I want to hear your automation ideas. No matter how crazy or far-fetched they seem, go ahead and leave them down in the comments and I'll do my best to make them happen and include them in my next Node-RED video. To sweeten the pot a little bit, if I end up selecting your automation, not only will I credit you in the next video, but I'll also send you a nice giveaway pack including some Shelly and Tuya gear. All you need to do is comment with your most creative and useful home automation idea. A big thanks to all of my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support of my channel. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.